Hello and welcome to another episode of Stan Sport FC. Thanks for joining us. I'm Vince Regari. Huge show ahead. Boz and Fozzer here. G'day, boys. Hey, hey. Happy how are we Valentine's going? Day. Oh, Boz, happy Valentine's Day. Yeah. Oh, happy Valentine's Day. Thank you for Day, that. Everyone. Lovely. Where well else wish. would you want to be? You know. <laughs> yeah. Other than on a couch with you guys talking about oh, football. Oh yeah. yeah. Man. Lot to talk about. Obviously, Champions massive. League's back this massive. week. We're going to preview yeah, all those huge. games. Yeah. Massive. Talk about right World Cup conference. as well. Yeah. Correct. But we're going to start, guys, massive. with um, the biggest guest I say we'd have. On this show, we haven't had many, but yep. I don't think we're going to get a bigger one than this. <laughs> yeah. Ange Prosecoglu is joining us live from his office in uh, in Lennox Town in, in Scotland. Ange, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, mate. Nice disclaimer there, mate, about me being the biggest guest. <laughs> yeah, so far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, guys. Great to see you all. Yeah, uh, just, just off the bat, Craig, um, great respect for what you're doing over there, mate. In terms oh. of, I've been away the last couple of years uh, with the refugees. Uh, an unbelievable cause, an unbelievable... Uh, Effort from yourself, mate. Great respect. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. And you're, by Very the way, you're, before we get to the questions, you're in a great place there as well. As I noticed, the Celtic fans are, have got a really strong social justice kind of streak and done some wonderful stuff uh, over the last few years. So yeah. like, you've started him yeah. off now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the only question I'll get uh, for the next the rest of the show. Um, you know, look, I, I found a real sort of. Um, affinity with a club. I mean, obviously, we all know the club really well, you know. I think it may be surprised people over here, um, you know, at the beginning that, you know, we, we seem like we're, we're a million miles away and almost, as I said a couple of times, on another planet. But, you know, we, we've always been more, more than aware about the great clubs around the world. Celtic's one of them. And, um, and mm. yeah, their whole background and why the actual club was formed, you know, to, to, to feed poor Irish immigrants, um, there was a purpose behind this club that stayed with it um, mm. right, right to this day. And, uh, yeah, for me, that, that resonates obviously strongly being an immigrant in our own country and South Melbourne, Hellas, yep. Melbourne, Croatia, Sydney, Croatia, all these clubs were set up the same way. You know, they weren't set up solely to be football clubs. Mm. They were set up to actually help people adjust to mm. to, to the life in, exactly. in, in, in a new land. So, um, yeah, there's a great sort of affinity there with, with me as well. Brilliant. Mm. And um, to start with, eight months ago, you joined Celtic and from the outside, it looked like the club was in a bit of disarray, it was coming off its first season in 10 years where it hadn't won a trophy, which is huge for Celtic. Uh, Rangers won the league by 25 points. Now, there's a lot of the season to go, obviously, but you're top of the table now. You've already won one trophy and it seems like all of Celtic is behind you. How have you done it? Look, I, I mean, there's nothing too unique there. I think, you know, anyone, any manager gets a job, you're usually going in because things aren't going well. You know, rarely will you pick it up when when, when a team's flying. So that part of it was was kind of, I understood that um, I think every role I've taken, the, the, I've taken when it needed, um, you know, some sort of new direction and I'm, I'm comfortable in that space. So from that perspective, I, I kind of knew I was entering into, obviously, the magnitude of the club and, as you said, coming off a season where they, they didn't win anything, I mean, it, it's very easy to, to kind of say, well, it's a league they should dominate. So <clears throat> about the same time, when you've come off a season where you, you've won nothing for, for a big club like this, it's, you know, Bozzi will tell you when it happens at a club like Manchester United, there's a massive sort of, there needs to be a massive reaction. So again, I, I kind of knew the magnitude of what I needed to do. And yeah, it's been, it's been, um, it's been pretty good so far. Um, you know, I've had tremendous support from, you know, the fans, I've had you know, good support within the football club to sort of take the club in, in the direction I wanted to. And, um, you know, I kind of knew that there was always, um, you know, a, a, a ticking clock against me to, to get it right as soon as we possibly could because it's it's not just for me. I think people, you know, sort of thought that, I, you know, I was worried about my own tenure. It wasn't that. It was just that a football club like Celtic can't go two seasons without having success. It just can't happen. So I knew that I had to get it right this first year. And um, as you said, we won a trophy. We're, we're doing, you know, okay in the league. We're still in Europe. Um, you know, we got through the Scottish FA Cup yesterday. So still plenty to do, mate, but um, going all right. Mm. And Angela, let's talk about that when you were originally appointed. Uh, and there was a few eyebrows raised. And as there always is, regardless of what it, where it is around the world, um, but I, I want to step inside your head. I mean, what did you say to, to basically the, the main people at the club, which are the players, and how did you say it? I mean, that opening address, in my opinion, is so important as being an ex-player 
and, and knowing, uh, you know, when a new manager comes in, how has the next player you look him up and down? Yeah, again, it's not an unusual space for me, Bozer. I mean, I, I know the whole of Australia loves me at the moment, but um, <laughs> you know, I've, had, I've had to prove myself over there as well. There was plenty of sceptics every time I got a role there. And that's only natural, as you said. I mean, that's that's the nature of football where, you know, there's always question marks when somebody um, gets appointed. Obviously, with me coming over here, there was, there was a lot of the unknown um, in terms of, you know, who I was and what I was about. Um, again, I... I it, that doesn't really affect me or the, the kind of messaging I have. I mean, my, my first address is, is always the same. It's about trying to get people to believe in me, right? So it doesn't matter how much knowledge I have, what I believe, what I want people to do, unless they actually believe in me as a person, uh, first of all, none of that will work. And, and, you know, wherever I've been, whether that was here or in Japan or you know, back in Australia with the different jobs I had there, it's, it's about trying to get people to understand me as a person, what I'm about, um, you know, what I believe, what my values are, um, how I want us to play our football, um, you know, the kind of uh, vision we're going to have for, for, for the kind of football team we're going we're gonna to be. Because um, to come in and talk about winning games and winning trophies, I don't think that's unique. I think there wouldn't be a, a manager on the world doesn't want to win, uh, doesn't want to win football games or in trophies, uh, that's not going to get people's attention. What you need to try and sell is something beyond that, and that's what I've always done. You know, for me, it's always been about the football. Um, play a certain way, um, have certain values, and you know, if I can get people to believe in me, then those kind of things tend to flow on a little bit quicker. Uh, having said that, Ange, um, and it's my turn to return the compliment. It's been, you know, wonderful to see. Uh, you know, the achievements that you've had this uh, season already, following on from Japan, uh, to take this club back to, well, the peak of the SPL, uh, to win your first trophy this season. Of course, we're so much looking forward to seeing you uh, in European competition again late this week. I know that uh, the player recruitment has obviously been a big part of what you've done there. You've brought in quite a high number of players. You made some comments about Japanese players recently, kind of, you know, um, I guess lecturing to the, the Scottish press, saying, look, don't put them all in the same basket. But you have got four across there. What about the other players that you brought in? What is it? Can you give us an insight into your recruitment, what you're looking at, what type of players that you're looking at to come in and play your football that allows you to make this huge quantum leap in such a short space of time? Well, that was, that was kind of probably one of the key things for me, Craig, because obviously, again, uh, anything I say or in terms of, again, what I'm trying to create is always secondary to, to the actions of what I do. And, and I knew that getting the right players in was going to be the first critical part of me being judged over there, uh, over here, sorry, um, in terms of my football knowledge and, and how I wanted uh -huh. to put this team up. Because if I signed players that didn't fit what I was saying and the kind of football, then it was going to be hard. So I had to really make sure that um, the players fitted the ideology of the kind of football team we wanted to be, uh, fit the kind of demographic in terms of ages and, and experience. Um, so those kind of things are really important. So, And it's always been a big part of what I do is, um, you know, getting the right players because it's the old, you know, square pegs, round holes. You've got to make sure because a lot of talented footballers in the world, as we know, there, uh -huh. there's multitudes of them, mate. I, we went to Brazil with South Melbourne. There was a couple of thousand on the beach yeah. I could have picked yep. to play for South Melbourne at the time. So <laughs> it's, not, it's not about just getting talented footballers, it's about footballers who fit into, into you know, um, my football. And, that, you know, a key one was, say, Kyogo Furuhashi, who I knew from Japan, played against him, watched him close up. I knew he had all the ingredients to, to, to be a success over here as an individual player because of the talent he had, but also in the, in the kind of football we want to play. So it comes back to me having a real clear idea of how you want the game to be played. Um, I've often said... I. I could go into a shop with my wife and she'll know exactly what to pick and buy, mate. I've got no idea. Uh, when I go when I go looking for players, I'm the same, you know. I've got a real clear... When I see what I want, um, I, I picture them in my team and, you know, when they fit that picture, um, most of the time I think it works. And, and it comes back to the first thing is that I, I have a real clear, absolute clarity about how I want my team to play. 
you know, what players, what qualities each player should have in each position that will fit. And that makes it easier for the players as well because they've already got some of the things I'm looking for. So their adjustment period becomes quicker. And so the players I've brought in, you know, have hit the ground running and people are saying, well, how quickly? Well, it's because I already know they've got the attributes I'm looking for. The rest is just them understanding the, the game plan. And just your point about the Japanese players, it wasn't so much lecturing because it wasn't just about the media. It was even mm-hmm. the football club here, right. you know, in terms of my own football clubs, to make sure we treat them as individuals because, mm-hmm. um, you know, sometimes, you know, the, those stereotypical things that we, we think about in life in general um, you know, don't ring true. And, and the four boys I brought over are totally different people, totally different types of players. And I just wanted to make sure that we, we treated them as individuals. Mm-hmm. Andrew, we put the word out for questions from um, people on social media to ask you, and a lot of people were keen to know uh, to what extent you keep an eye on, on the A-League and, I guess, Australian players. We know you were very close to signing Riley McGree recently, but um, Stephen Ganavis off Twitter is asking, he's genuinely interested to know if Celtic are active in scouting the A-League, and if you see the A-League as a, as a league that could potentially be a boom export league in the future. There's been a couple of young fellas that have even gone over to Scotland as well at Hearts with Devlin and Atkinson and a couple others bubbling under the surface. Are there players uh, who could be of interest for Celtic in, in the A-League at the moment? Look, I'm, I'm, I mean, obviously because of vested interest, I'm always watching the A-League anyway because, you know, there's a lot of uh, guys who, you know, I know and I work with and um, who, who are coaching in particular in the A-League, so I follow their progress very closely. Um, a lot of people are, you know, still keep in touch with over there. So, yeah, you know, I mean, I follow the A-League. In terms of scouting, I mean, I, you know, I... The one thing I've, again, maybe coming because I come from a place like Australia where we've had to be fairly clever and, and you know, sort of have some ingenuity around the way we look at the game. I, I look at everywhere, mate. Um, I don't corner just one market. I mean, here they tend to be focused on certain markets. Um, you know, but I know talent can be found anywhere in the world, including Australia, you know, and Asia is, is, is obviously, um, Asian football is something that I'm, I'm I've great knowledge on. I'm very fond of not just Japanese football, um, other parts of the region. So, you know, in terms of our scouting, we look everywhere. Obviously, with Australian players, you know, I have better knowledge. I have good information networks there. So, if anyone does stand out, but, um, it's not about me trying to um, give opportunities just for the sake of it. It will be opportunities for people. I think because again, it's got to be the right fit for the player to, to come over here and and be successful. Um, um, you know, the, the lads that, as you said, are, that have already come over here um, are doing really well at Hearts and, and it's great to see them both, um, you know, developing their football. So, um, always keeping an eye on it. And, Andrew, the style of play you spoke about, well, since I've been closely watching you uh, manage size, always been attractive and, and always won, which uh, I, I hold so important. But in, in terms of when you have that period when you want to get those players in, do you, do you have to tweak a few things just to adjust to the players that you already have? I mean, we're talking specifically, obviously, about club management here because, obviously, that's a little bit of a transition time when you, when you may perhaps realise that somebody you already have can't do quite what you're asking. So do you have to tweak it a little bit then? Yeah, you, you know I'm not a plan B kind of guy. So I know you've been, <laughs> no, all right, eight and a half. Plan you, eight you, and a half. You've been, yeah. at me for the, you've been at me for the last 15 years about this. So, and... and, 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 and and, and God bless you. I love you for it. But, but I just, I just don't compromise because ultimately, like you said, the, the key thing is, is at the end of the day, winning football games. Yeah. yeah. So, um, as you say, you know, and and for me, I know you say attractive. I, I, I think you can find attractiveness in any kind of football. Yeah. Ultimately, many different ways to be successful. Many different ways to to kind of, um, you know, play this beautiful game of ours. And there's beauty in all of it. You know. Yeah. Some of us just appreciate different things. And, mm. and But for me, the reason I coach the way I coach is that's what I'm good at. You yeah. know, that's what I can do. That's the skill set I bring to it. And, you know, if, if the players haven't adjusted yet, um, I won't compromise because I think that's the critical period where it gets really tested, mm. when things aren't going well or when, when maybe you don't have the right kind of players. Now, obviously, you know, you've got to get it right quickly. So you, you, you kind of try and accelerate that process as much as you can and, mm-hmm. and by by giving as much information to the players as possible. But for me, all those kind of things, the tests come when, when things aren't going smoothly. And it's probably why in all my the jobs I've had, the initial period is always rocky is because I don't compromise at the start. Mm-hmm. And, and 
obviously players and, and everyone struggles with it. Even staff struggle with it initially just to just to get the concepts right. But I, I just I, I just don't compromise on that. I just think um, ultimately it's the football I want my teams to play, which you know is a big driver for me. And it's been very, very successful. I just think it's the way to win for me as, as a manager. I've always said to people, if, if you want me to go out there on the weekends and get a and, and set up the team to to sit back and, and get a point in a game, a draw, I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. I, I, I just, it's just not in my skills. I, you know, I've said to people a few times, when I walked into the football library, I went to one section and I stayed there. <laughs> anywhere else. Oh, that's great. Uh, Ange, let's turn now to a European competition, mm. if we can. Obviously, that's the big focus for us here at Stan. Uh, we know, we'll turn to the game later this week in a moment. But just your reflections on, you know, playing... You, you came into some qualifiers very early, which must have been hugely challenging. That's before you got, a, a, you know, a heap of players in and before you had time to really change the football there. Uh, give us a sense of, you know, how difficult that was and what you saw. And also then you were in a group with two really top teams. You know, Raul Batis, a uh, very experienced coach, you know, third in La Liga. You were, had Leverkusen, currently still third in Bundesliga. And you ran them very, very close as you were still building the team. Talk to us about European competition. Also, perhaps those two different styles of football. What differences do you see across Europe? Yeah, so that was that was probably my most challenging bit, Craig. That I knew that those qualifiers come really early, and they're really important for the club. Yeah, um, mm. that chance yeah. to play in Champions League is is massive for for a club like Celtic. And I also knew that we were nowhere near ready to to, mm. to, to tackle that task. So that was the, that was the, the the most challenging period for me. And um, you know, we 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 played really well, not really well. We played okay in the first game against Mitchell and here, and and we. we we drew with them and then we, we lost an extra time over there, but which knocked us out of the first qualifying round. But but, but in my gut, I knew we weren't ready for it. You know, I, I had a, I knew instinctively that it was just a bridge too far for where the team was at at the time. So, but I was still disappointed because, I, you know, obviously that was a chance for me to make an impact for the football club. Um, but then when we got into the group stages, I mean, I, firstly, I love, you know, I, I love playing. Um, in the Europa League, and, and particularly, like I said, against the, the calibre of opponents we had, it was a real challenge for me as a, as a manager and and, I, and um, to play against um, ostensibly what you know, Leverkusen to me are a Champions League side um, in any other year. You know, they're they're, they're, they're a fantastic team, and as you said, um, Batiste with Pellegrini the last couple of years has been outstanding. Mm. So I, I got really excited when we got the group because I thought, okay, here's a real good test yep. for us, and, and we got tested, mate. Um, right. First game we had at home against Leverkusen, and we lost four 0 We bizarrely enough played really well, created some great chances, but got absolutely punished right. for the smallest of mistakes. And you can't understand the levels in this game that that exist. Um, but really proud of the players that you know. After that, we kind of said, okay, we, you know, we 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 had to cop a little bit of a hide in, uh, on the day, but we did it. Um, with the knowledge that that was going to improve us because we tested ourselves so ultimately. Right. We could have gone out there, lost one or two nil, and not really found out anything. But I think we found out a lot about ourselves that day, and the players did. I think the players got a bit of courage from that because I, I didn't change anything after that. I said to them, "Look, that's that's the team we want to be, and that's the gap. They're, they're a four goal better team than us because they punished our mistakes, and we didn't punish theirs." So, um, but then you know we, we grew as the tournament went into it. We 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 lost three two away to Leverkusen, another great game. We took it to them in there. You know, on their home ground, which again, I was proud of the players that we, we we were brave enough to do that. And then, you know, we beat Batiste at home, which was, which again was important because any time you win, you know, again going back to Boz's point, you know, winning is paramount in football. You know, it's not the aesthetics are all great, but ultimately you've got to deliver, you've got to win. And yeah. uh, for us to win against the really top side in, in in the Europa League was important. And then we had we had our two wins against French Fire. So I think it was a, it's been a great learning curve for. For, for us as a, as a, as a group um, to know that, okay, this is the kind of football we want to play. We're not going to compromise just because we're in Europe and to know what the best do and how we, we need to improve to cope with it, but also that we can be successful. So, you know, going to the Conference League now and, um, you know, it's a great opportunity again to just test ourselves to some fantastic clubs left in it. Uh, Bodo Glint, you know, the Norwegian champions the last two years, yeah. play a really expansive uh, aggressive type of football, so yeah, can't wait for him. Mm -hmm. 
Andrew, we've got another uh, Twitter question for you. This one from uh, Simple Cactus. And a slightly bigger picture on this one. Uh, has being in Japan and now Scotland given you a clearer perspective on the issues in Australian football and how to solve them? <laughs> well, I, I, look, you, you know what? You all know Australian football is so close to my heart. And, and I kind of said after I left the national team job, you know, Australian football and me just needed a you know, a trial separation, just some space because, you know, it, it like a lot of people in Australia, it, it had worn me down um, because I just wanted to succeed so much. I wanted to 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 become, for us to become the football nation. I know we can become, mm. but, you know, there's, you know, the, the problems are so um, endemic in certain parts of our game that I found it really hard to, to break free. I, look, I thought when I took the national job, I thought that was my that was my opportunity, right? So I had this real clear vision about what I wanted to do as national team manager that I thought would go a long way to sort of, not that I had all the answers, but helping us open some doors to finding some solutions for our game. And, right. and again, I based it around one thing is that, um, and, and Bozzy, you remember, we had this conversation. Right. When I got appointed to the national team, um, I remember Bozza spoke to me and he said, Ange, don't go to, don't take the team to the 2014 World Cup. So it, it, you're in a hiding to nothing. Let somebody else take it and then get, take it over for the Asian Cup. And I remember at the time thinking that, no, no, I want to win the Asian Cup. I, the reason I was obsessed with winning the Asian Cup, because I thought that that could be a watershed moment for Australian football, because I think winning is everything. Right? So mm-hmm. I, I equated it to the Euros. When when a nation wins the Euros, irrespective of how strong the nation, so it could be a Denmark or a Greece, it's a seminal moment in that country's evolution because all of a sudden they feel like they've achieved something. You know? mm-hmm. So for me, going to the 2014 World Cup was important because I wanted to start planting the seeds of us 12 months later, lifting a trophy, a continental trophy that I thought would then give me the power and also allow me the opportunity and give us a, as a nation to stand up and say, okay, this is who we are now. We want to be, we want to be the dominant side in our region, Asia, yeah. which is not easy. Okay, we've already seen that yeah. in, in in World Cup uh, qualifying campaigns. Okay. But I wanted us to be the Brazil or the Germany or whatever other nation that dominates its its region, and that was my starting point. But I just felt, you know, I think it was even a week after when Asia, I just felt really flat because I just didn't. It didn't have the impact I thought it would. I, I misread what happened, you know, and. Uh, what the impact it would possibly have. And and then sort of through that World Cup campaign, I just felt like we'd just gone back into that cycle again of, you know, not understanding what it takes to become, you know, a really strong footballing nation. And it wasn't just about um, qualifying for World Cups. It was having an identity, being, right. you know, believing in something, you know. And and I, I, I still don't think we, we, we've, you know, capitalise on what I thought it should have been. I mean, we've been to four Asian Cups, you know, and we've only won one. So it's not like we can, we sit here and say, well, and it's easy to win. Right? Uh-huh. It's not like that. And it could be another four before we win it again, uh-huh. right? So that's – and that was going to be my benchmark. That was going to say, well, from now on, don't accept anything less than winning the Asian Cup every time, qualifying for the World Cup, but make it being the number one nation in Asia. And I, 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 I couldn't find that, that sort of um, – golden key to open that up i just i just felt at the end of it i i was determined to make us qualify for another world cup and with that group of players and i know we went through the playoffs and again you know we're, we may have to go through playoffs again people dismiss that that's very very difficult to do i mean you guys uh-huh. and it, we didn't always not qualify in playoffs against south america opposition uh-huh. you guys know yeah. sometimes against asian opposition 100 playoff yeah. games are tough mm-hmm. playoff games are tough yeah. mm-hmm. so you know the group still got through that, you know. Even when we went to the Confederations Cup, my idea was to get to the semi-finals of Confederations Cup, you know. And I was gutted when we, we, we you know, against Chile, we had our opportunities that day. So yeah. that was my vision for it. Now, the reason I, I talk about it like that is because, you know, the answers I thought were there weren't the right ones, obviously, right? And and, and so moving forward, what this does solve it, I just think we need, you know constant scrutiny, constantly, you know, there are some bright young coaches out there, some bright young people out there. We need to, to, to start tapping into them and hopefully they've got the energy to, 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 to make us the football nation I believe we can be. Mm. Beauty. 
And we're going to uh, focus a little bit more on, I guess, the game coming up on Friday morning in Spoto Glim. To do that, we're going to bring in uh, Norwegian football expert Lars Siversen. Lars, welcome to the show. Good to have you. Hi. And spoke yeah, a little bit more me. about uh, Bodo Glimt earlier. What can you tell us about uh, what Ange's team is going to expect on, on Friday morning, our time? It's such an interesting matchup because there's real similarities between the way they approach the game and what Ange is doing at, at Celtic. They also, tactically, they also like to, well, obviously play a 4-3-3, but they like to try to win the ball high up the field. They look after the ball, but they also look to try to raise the tempo when they can. But, but aside from the obvious tactical stuff, they have a real sort of holistic approach to treating the players as human beings. Uh, they, they've done stuff like they've brought in a former fighter pilot uh, to do mental coaching sessions with them. Uh, they've encouraged everyone to maybe try meditating if that could help them. They have a real culture of openness where players are encouraged to speak to each other about what's going on. Uh, so the tactical stuff we see here right now, this is this is like watching Angel Celtic, the quick exchange of passes. Look. Um, uh, so, so, so in tactical, I mean, when, when Angel has been doing prep for this, you'll have recognized a lot from mm. Bodo Glimt, uh, from, from what you, you get your own team to do. Mm. But again, the holistic approach to how you treat footballers is really interesting. And Bodo Glimt came from nowhere to be a success, not from nowhere, but from a very low base. There, Tabuda is a town of 50,000 people. It's uh, inside the Arctic Circle. They'd never won the league before. And, and they, they've stormed the league two seasons in a row, and they've done it largely with sort of players who were quite unknown in Norway as well, and players who had failed other other places, not other teams. There had been no buying of established stars at all, but, they, but they've created an environment off there where players feel appreciated and where they develop in, in a way that they just haven't been able to do uh, elsewhere. Ange, does, uh, does that ring true for you? And I <laughs> guess, uh, how are you looking at preparing for this game? Obviously, acknowledging the fact you guys have got a, a whole heap of games on this month, so it's probably pretty heavy on the legs. Yeah, no, absolutely, and, and and people, you know, should realise that that footage that's against Roma, yeah, that's against yeah, Jose yeah. Mourinho, incredible, Roma, yeah. you know? and they did it, Six. and they did it in and they did it in Rome as well, you know. Yeah, they, too, too, yeah. So my attention, you know, they grabbed my attention back then, even before we knew we were going to mm. play them. So I think um, they've got an outstanding young manager, and 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 they do they play like I said, a real expansive, really progressive kind of football. So it should be a cracking game. Um, look, you know, we we like I said, we're in a heavy schedule of games, but at the same time, we're we're kind of you know in a in a good mode at the moment in terms of you know we're in good form and, and obviously you know, players fit. Whereas with Bodo, they're a bit similar to us in our Champions League qualifiers because you know obviously their season they're in pre-season mode at the moment. So you know potentially that could work both ways. You know. We're, Maybe we we will match sharpness, but um, they may have a freshness about them. But I've got no doubt they'll be cracking games, both of them, because um, um, you know they, they they do play a really expansive kind of football. We're not going to change our approach. Um, uh, as you said, we're, we're heading to the Arctic Circle, so <laughs> my complaint: the Scottish weather will go out the window. When we're <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so but 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 that's that's the beauty of European football. That's why yeah. uh, for me as a manager, that's that's probably. You know, the, the, the stuff that gets the adrenaline going is just to test yourself, different conditions, different kinds of um, teams, different kinds of um, setups. So looking forward to it immensely. I, I think they'll be great games. Yeah, Lars is going to stick Thank with you. us for the rest of the show. Ange, we wish you could too, but we have to let you go. Unfortunately, you've got a few we'll things see you on. Thank, morning. You. Thank you so much, Ange. Absolute pleasure to have you on. Thanks, guys. And good that luck. was brilliant. Good Thank you so much. Take care, boys. Take care. Stuff. Super. How good, eh? Absolutely yeah, super. Great. Very, very fortunate. Yeah. Uh, Friday morning is going to be unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Friday morning is going to be exciting. Good time very, for us. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 7 a.m. 7 a.m. Right? Yeah, hugely attractive, but that was brilliant. Uh, yeah. He certainly hasn't yeah. lost uh, his attractiveness as, as a person and a football brain. <laughs> and just listen to him. listening to him is, uh, is great. And I think it would be yeah. great for all our Australian viewers as well. It was, it was a really good interview.